Well, it's good to see all of you, and uh, all joking aside about the UCLA-USC rivalry things, it's, uh, I am good, I'm happy to be back, I'm happy to be there as well, but I'm happy to be back and, and be with you all, um, and it's good to see you, it's good to see you. Uh, if you can open your Bibles to the book of Luke, to the book of Luke, we're going to be spending some time in there tonight. When uh, Chris asked me to uh, preach for our UCLA-USC joint GOC night, I started thinking about uh, what I would want to talk to you all about. Uh, and I started thinking about different things. I, of course, what came across my mind was, oh, unity, that we're one in Christ. But that's just kind of cheesy, right? I mean, it's a little, even for me, a little too cheesy. Um, so I thought, no, let's not do that. So I thought about, well, what, uh, what burdens my heart? What, what burdens have I felt since I graduated from college? And there's two that come to mind, really. Two that come to mind. And the first one um, really began growing right after I graduated and stopped walking up and down the hills of Westwood, uh, the hills of UCLA to go to class. And that, that burden really started to grow mainly, uh, mainly around my midsection. And that was, uh, that was just unfortunate. Uh, and so the, the warning for that is, guys, after you graduate, do, do try to exercise and walk around a little bit. Uh, but the second burden, the second burden is what I want to talk to you about tonight. And that burden of mine um, has grown over the past few years. As I, as I graduated from UCLA and as I uh, graduated from GOC, uh, I began to see friends of mine uh, who were once strong and solid in their faith begin to waver, begin to grow in their doubts, begin to question what they once held to be true. Uh, friends of mine who... Uh, wrestled with doubts, some backslid, and some fell away altogether. And I know I, I speak not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of all the leaders here, uh, that that is that's a, that's a burden that rests on our hearts. Uh, that's heartbreaking when we hear that happen. And for those of you who grew up in church, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, even from your transition from high school to now, you, you can think of those friends that you grew up with going to church, and when you go back home during break, they're not there. They're not at church. They're not walking with the Lord, and you know what I'm talking about, and it's heartbreaking. Maybe you're thinking, well, sure, that happens in other churches and other campus ministries, but not at, not at Grace Community Church. We've got John MacArthur. We've got Chris G. It may happen to others, but, but not to me. I'm looked up to in my class. I'm a ministry team leader. I'm a, I'm a small group leader. It's not going to happen to me. I just want to share one story with you about a friend of mine who was a student here. He was a, a year older than me, and, and from everything I could tell, he was mature. He was godly. He led one of the ministry teams here. He shared the gospel passionately, clearly. Um, I learned a lot from him. I, I enjoyed talking with him with what I thought was times of sweet fellowship. Um, Around the time that he graduated, though, but before that even, he, he began having doubts about the Christian faith. He began doubting what he once held so, so firmly. And I would talk to him. He, he was wrestling through these doubts, and a couple years later, he, he just decided, it's enough. I, I don't believe. He walked away from it all. He wanted to be a missionary in China. He wanted to do all these different things for Christ. And I, and I knew that at that time... I, he was serious. As, as far as he could be in his own heart, he was genuine. But he walked away. And he's living in a, a life just pursuing blatant sin. And, and it's heartbreaking. It, it is really heartbreaking. Um, by God's grace, I think this doesn't happen as often as it does in, in some other ministries, in this ministry anyway, God is gracious uh, by the preaching of his word, by the faithful ministry of godly men here. I, I think that happens far less than, than what is common in many college ministries, but it still happens. And, and that's why I, I want, want to share this burden with you. I want to point us to some scripture that would address this area, that, that helped me understand what happened with my friend, what happens with those of us 
uh, th- those friends of ours who walk away? What, what happened? How do we understand that? And more importantly, for you as you are in college now, how do you make sure you are not that one? That you are not that one that everyone says, man, that's a shame. That's heartbreaking. So maybe you're thinking of someone else in your class, someone in your small group, someone in your apartment or your dorm that you're thinking, yeah, you know, their, their, faith, is, uh, their, their, weak is, their faith is weak at best. Uh, I wonder where they'll be in a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Uh, that's an appropriate question for a different time. We are to be our brother's keeper. You are, in a sense, responsible for each other. Yeah, in the sense of community and accountability. Yeah, yeah, we should watch out for one another, but tonight I want you to focus on your own soul and ask yourself the hard questions. Our text tonight is found in Luke 8, verses 4 to 15. It's a familiar passage to many of you. It's the parable of the sower or maybe the, the parable of the soils, as it's also sometimes called. It's familiar, but I hope that familiarity tonight would not breed contempt, but that God would give us fresh eyes to see and fresh ears to hear what he would have us hear. What I want to do is walk through the parable first. You know this parable well. Jesus gives the parable and then he gives the explanation of the parable. Um, when I was thinking about what to, what to preach on, I thought, hey, this parable would be great, especially because Jesus explains it. So that makes my job a lot easier. So I want to walk through the parable and kind of explain the story to you if you're not familiar with it. And then when we get to Jesus' explanation of the parable, I want to give you an outline to follow along. So look with me, uh, Luke 8, verse 4. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. We'll stop right there right now. Uh, Verse 4 explains that a large crowd was coming together. They were following him from different cities. In a parallel passage in Mark 4, it said it was a a very large crowd, uh, so much so that Jesus got in a boat, put off from the shore a little bit, and the, the crowds, the multitude, they were, they were on the shore listening to him. They were listening to him. This incident is also recorded in Matthew 13. All three of the synoptic gospels record this incident, this, this parable. And then Jesus spoke this story. Right, parables are a, a story, earthly setting with a heavenly or spiritual meaning. He spoke by way of a parable. In verse 5, Jesus says, The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell beside the road. It was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil. And as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and with it, grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil. And grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Familiar story. Jesus describes a man going about throwing seed. Probably he's got a little bag over his shoulder, going through his field, throwing seed. We don't know a lot about the man, we don't know a lot about the seed. How he's throwing it is just telling us he's going through. He's, he's sowing his seed. The first soil, the first soil is the soil that's beside the path, along the path, along this road. And in these times, you would have uh, these paths kind of dividing fields or going through them. Uh, they were hard packed in dried dirt because you would walk, you would have your animals walk through there. Maybe the, the wheels of your cart would pack that dirt until it was, it was rock hard as he sowed his seeds into the field. Some of those seeds would fall on that road, bounce right off. The the birds ate it up, trampled underfoot, and never had a chance to to grow. The second soil said it fell among rocky soil. Uh, Not like soil where there's just kind of rocks here and there. The, The farmer would have picked out those rocks. What it means is that under this thin layer of soil, there was bedrock. See, in the land of Palestine, in that area... There was limestone underneath the, the ground there, and in some areas that limestone would come up right up near the top. So the top soil was, was thin, maybe just a couple inches deep. Throwing his seed. Some of the seed would, would land on there. The, the seed would grow quickly, 
but because it couldn't reach its roots down, it would die when the sun came out and essentially withered it, scorched it. The third soil, the third soil was thorny. It was full of thorns. Now, probably it wasn't like there was just a field with thorns in it. It, Probably the the farmer had uh, cultivated the ground, plowed it, picked out the weeds. But you know, when you pick out, when you pull out weeds, what do you have to do? You have to make sure you get out the the roots, right? So these thorns, these weeds, pulling them out, but sometimes if you don't get all the roots, what happens in a couple weeks? They grow back. So as he's sowing his seed, he doesn't know, but there's some thorns in there. There's some weeds. There's some there's some roots in there that are going to grow, that are going to grow back. Sown his seed. As that seed grows, the, the weeds grow up with it. The weeds grow up with it and choke it out, and the, the seed, the plant, can't grow and bear fruit. And that last soil is good soil. That last soil is good soil, and it grows up. There's no thorns. There's no rocks underneath. It grows, and it bears fruit a hundredfold, a hundredfold. It's a simple story, not a lot to it. The people of Jesus' time would have understood that very clearly. They would have been, oh, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, I remember that, that time I sowed some seed. Yeah. And so Jesus was relating to the people. They, they, they understood the story, but Jesus said something so interesting. He said, let, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What he was saying was, if you can understand this, pay attention. Pay attention. There were those who heard the story, but it was just a story. It was nothing more than that to them. Jesus was teaching by way of parables because he was hiding truth in a sense. This was a form of judgment on those who had rejected him. So he taught in parables. Verse 9 says that his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. They wanted to know. They they didn't understand, but they wanted to have those ears to hear. They wanted to understand. So Jesus said to them in verse 10, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. This was a quote from Isaiah when, when God commissioned Isaiah. He said something so interesting. He said, go and preach to these people, but they're not going to hear you. They'll hear you, but they won't understand. That's bizarre. Uh, It it was a form of judgment on the people. Judgment for the rejection of God. So he taught them in parables. Now, before we get into Jesus' explanation, I want to point out a few observations. I want to point out a few observations so we can understand the big picture, the main point of this parable. Uh, Notice the repetition of of certain words. Verse 8 He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The end of verse 10, hearing they may not understand. We haven't gotten to the the rest of the verses yet, but in verse 12, it says, those beside the road are those who have heard. Verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. Heard, verse 15, the seed in the good soil. These are the ones who have heard. We're not going to cover the verses after that, but those two sections are also very closely related. Look at verse 18. So take care how you listen or take care how you hear. Verse 21, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. What's that word that keeps coming up? Talk to me. What's that word? Hear. Hear. The the main point here is how you hear. How do you hear the word of God and how do you respond to it? The word goes out. The seed goes out. But how are you responding? How are you responding? It's that same Greek word all throughout, to hear. And what are they to hear? They are to hear the word of God. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed being scattered everywhere. This is the word of God. It's going forth. The word of God is going forth. The seed is everywhere. But how is the word being received? How are you hearing the word of God? And a seed is a great analogy for the word of God, is it not? A seed has, 
has the potential for life and growth. And so it is with the Word of God, that the Word of God has, has potential to change your life, has the potential to take root in your heart and absolutely blossom into something amazing and huge compared to that original tiny seed. So this parable is fundamentally about hearing the Word of God, and more specifically, how how, in what manner you hear the word of God. Let's make some more observations. What, what aspect of this parable or of this story receives the most attention? Is it the, the sower? Is it the seed? Or is it the soils? What is it? The soils. The soils. It doesn't say much about the sower. doesn't say much about the seed besides the, the fact that it's the word of God. But then he describes four various types of, of soils, and these soils represent the, the heart. We're going to see that. They represent the heart. So in addition to being about how you hear, this is really about the heart of the hearer. What kind of a heart do you hear the word of God? With what kind of a heart do you hear the word of God? So in other words, this parable could be understood as a call. This is a call to examine your heart, to examine the soil of your heart and how it responds to the word of God. So as we move through this passage, I want you to think about that. This is going to help me examine the soil of my heart and how I respond to the word of God. And as we go through this passage, I want to give you four, I want to give you four penetrating questions. Four penetrating questions to examine the soil of your heart. The first question found in verse 12, the first question is, is there, is there satanic confiscation? Is there satanic confiscation? Look at, look at verse 12 with me. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. The hardened, dry, packed down soil beside or along the road represents those who have heard the word, but they have never even given a second thought. It goes in one ear and out the other. They don't even pay attention to it. They've never had the, the, the words never had the chance to sit on their minds and ruminate. Notice the preposition there. It says beside or along the road. Later on, we're going to see that the seed fell on it, on the, on the soil or into the soil, among the soil. But here it says beside it, along. There's this idea that there's, there's limited interaction here. The word really doesn't interact with this person's heart. This is the person who is hostile to the gospel, who, who wants to hear nothing of it. But this isn't just the staunch atheist who rejects the, the gospel out of hand. This is even the, the, the moral person who says, yeah, you know what, that's great. I'm, I'm so glad you're passionate about that and you found what works for you. But they, they themselves won't even consider it. Our hearts break for these souls and this kind of soil because they need the gospel. And they won't even give it a second chance. It's in one ear, out the other, and what happens? Satan comes and he confiscates the word. He takes it away. Uh, this reminds me of a similar idea in 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4, to where Paul says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is sad. They can see and hear the physical reality. They can understand the story. The seed goes. It, it doesn't fall into the dirt. The birds eat it up. Yeah, I get that. But they don't understand the spiritual reality that this is describing their own hearts. So as you examine the soil of your own heart, is there a satanic confiscation? Is, is there a hardness of your heart that just refuses to even consider the gospel? And if there is, I, I, hope you, I hope you tune in tonight. And I hope as we move through this passage that you would hear, that you would have ears to hear. So that's the first penetrating question to examine the soil of your heart. And the second is this. Is there superficial commitment? 
is their superficial commitment. Look at verse 13. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in the time of temptation, fall away. Now again, notice the preposition here. It's it's on the rocky soil. It's, It's just right on top. That rocky soil, right underneath that thin layer of topsoil is is rock-hard limestone. The seed falls on top, and it grows up quickly, but it, it, can't, it can't sink its roots down. It can't sink its roots down and, and develop any stability. This is the superficially committed. The seed sprouts quickly. There's the, the, the sun comes up, scorches it, withers away. This is the person who receives the gospel with joy, the, the person who... They tell you they've received Christ. They believe the gospel and they have all this joy. And you've seen this. You've seen this, right? Initially, they, they want to share the gospel with everybody. They want to do all these things, but a month, two months, a year goes by and they're nowhere to be found. They believe for a while. Why? It's the shallowness of their commitment. The roots of faith can't go deep enough. So when temptation, testing, or trials come, these individuals, they fall away. They fall away. Do you, do you have only a shallow commitment to Christ? Do you have only a superficial commitment to Christ? Are you just a fair-weather Christian, only professing faith when it's convenient or helpful or beneficial to you in some way? Brothers and sisters, testing and trials will come in your life. It's been said, all you have to do is live long enough and you will suffer. And, and when that happens, what are you going to do? Are your roots deep enough to handle that? James 1 verse 2 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, if... It says when. When you encounter various trials. You will. That same word here, those trials, temptations, is translated in 1 Peter 4 verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. It's not strange. It's not strange for you to suffer. Just because you're a believer, just because you're the child of the king does not mean you're going to go through this life unscathed by sin and by difficulty and by pain. You will go through difficult times, and in this time, you might not have it. But there is coming a time, and, and it's going to be shown, are your roots deep? Are your roots deep enough to last through? 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a haunting verse. You may not have experienced persecution for your faith up to this point, but you will. You will. Are you aware of that? Are you ready for that? Or is your commitment to Christ superficial? Is it shallow? Let me, let me be honest here for a minute, Grace on Campus. This place, GOC, and don't just mean this place literally here, I also mean GOC over at USC. GOC has to be one of the easiest places to be a Christian. Has to be one of the easiest places to be a Christian. You are looked up to if you study your Bible. People admire you when you share the gospel. I saw you sharing the gospel on campus today. That's awesome, man. GOC rightly values godliness, but the world will not. Now, let me, let me be clear. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that's a weakness of GOC. That's great. I mean, that's, that's just a, a, an extension. That's a manifestation of biblical fellowship, that we would love one another, that we would encourage one another towards godliness, that we would, that we would say that is an example to be followed. That's great, but there's something a little scary when it's too easy to be a Christian. If I can borrow or kind of apply that agricultural analogy here, think, since we're talking about sowing seed, grace on campus is like a greenhouse on campus. Right? It's like a greenhouse on campus. It's easy to grow here. 
you, you are largely shielded from persecution and suffering. Godliness is celebrated and encouraged. You have people watching over your soul, pulling out the weeds for you, right? It's easy to be a Christian here. You're encouraged to be. You're encouraged for that. You, you are adequately watered by the word. Most of you live with fellow believers who hold the same values as you do, and, and if you were out of line, they would confront you lovingly. This is all great, and I'm glad. This is because we practice the one another's in fellowship. But I wonder what life will be like after you leave the greenhouse on campus. What is life going to be like after the greenhouse on campus? Now, I, I find it a pet peeve when people graduate and they say, oh, well, yeah, you know, GOC was great, but now I'm, in, now I'm living the real life. This is real life. I'm not, I'm not denying it. This is real life, but this is a unique time period, and, and it's going to get harder from here on out. It will get harder. What happens when, when you're laughed at for your godliness rather than praise? What happens when the cool thing to do is not to memorize the Bible, but to complain and gossip at work? What will you pursue? What, will you still pursue godliness when it doesn't pay? When sanctification is easy to pursue and somehow advantageous to you, there's a danger that that sanctification might be fake and shallow. And my prayer is that it would not be for you. But sanctification that is difficult and costly is trustworthy. When it costs you something to stand up for Christ, when it costs you something to pursue godliness, that's trustworthy. Because in some ways, suffering and difficulty, that's like the litmus test of true faith. True faith will persevere under difficulty, under trials, and, and, and even more so, faith is purified by trials, is it not? So when trials come in your life, I hope you would sink those roots even deeper, even deeper. I challenge you to ask yourself, is your, is your commitment superficial? Have you grown roots that go deep, deep into the word of God? It's easy to appear godly and, and grow at GOC, join a ministry team, join a small group, it's easy to do those things outwardly, but in your heart of hearts, have you committed yourself, staked your life on the gospel such that you would say with Paul, if Christ is not risen, I am to be pitied above all men because I've given my whole life for Christ. Does that characterize your life? So we've, we've had two questions. Is there satanic confiscation? Is there superficial commitment? Now, the third penetrating question to examine the soil of your heart, is there, is there sinful competition? Is there sinful competition? Look with me at verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Again, notice the, the preposition there. It's among, among. The seed falls among the thorns. The seed is not alone in that soil. There's something else there. The, the visible signs of thorns and weeds might be gone, but remember in, in verse 7 it says the thorns, they grew up along with it. And so in this case, those who hear the, th- those who who are the thorny soil, they hear the gospel, they make some sort of response to the gospel, but as they try to live out this Christian life, their efforts are choked out by competing desires. There's competing desires that choke out their desire to live for God, to walk with Christ. What are these sinful competing desires? They're worries, riches, and pleasures of this life. Now, when you hear that, riches and pleasures, they kind of make sense. Worries, where does that, where does that fit in? And I, I think this makes perfect sense when you consider what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you cannot serve God and wealth. Right? You cannot serve God and wealth. And then he says, therefore, do not worry. Do not worry. 
That's kind of a strange therefore. Oh, why does he connect those two? Because those who love wealth will worry when they don't have it. Can I put it another way? Worry reveals what you worship. What you worry broadcasts what you worship. So worries, riches, and pleasures, it's, you're worried about the stuff of this life, the pleasures of this life, the riches of this life. So back here in Luke, the the worries of this life are related to riches and pleasure. And and the seed of the word cannot grow in the soil because it's crowded out by a love for something else, a love for something more, a a, a lack for something that you want, that worry. The, The seed of the word of God must be the only thing growing in the soil of your heart. Is there sinful competition? The the seed of God's word simply will not grow if there's competition. It will be choked out. It will be choked out. Again, in our greenhouse on campus, to some extent, the soil of your heart, or at least outwardly, is constantly being pruned, right? it's, It's hard for you to blatantly sin without someone coming alongside you gently, sometimes not so gently, rebuking you, rightly so. Outwardly, it's hard to maintain thorns in your life. My question to you is, in your heart of hearts, are there roots? Are there roots hiding? Where at night, if you, if you were to ask, or if you were asked the question, what do you love most? What do you want most out of this life? What would be your answer? Would you say, hallelujah, all I have is Christ? Or would you say, I, to be honest, I, I want wealth. That's, that's what I want. I want to be liked by people. I want to have a comfortable life. I want to be known by people. I want people to know who I am and like me. I, I want to have, I want to have uh, that, that perfect marriage and that perfect picture-perfect family. I want to buy that house, go on those vacations. Maybe you want to be known for your spiritual maturity, that spiritual pride. Oh, that's, that's maybe the worst. You can certainly hide your sin here in the greenhouse on campus, but it's My question to you is, what happens after you leave that greenhouse? What happens after you leave that greenhouse? And no one's watching over you. No one cares whether you pursue Christ or not, whether you you pursue the, the, the wealth of the world. If there are unrepented of sins in your heart, you can hide them now, but those thorns will grow. Those thorns will grow, and they will choke out the word if they are not checked. They are not repented of. Is there any sinful competition in your heart that's choking out the word? Remember the the story of the rich young ruler. He came up to Jesus. He was desperate. He ran up. He knelt before the Lord, and he said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? This is an evangelistic slam dunk. Easy. Easy, rich young ruler. We'll call him rich. Easy, rich. You just just believe that I'm going to die on the cross in a little bit. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, die on the cross for your sins. Believe in me, and you will be saved. If you share the gospel with Rich, he would have said, Great, let's pray the prayer. Let's do this. Let's sign the deal. Jesus didn't do that. Why? Jesus knew the heart of that man, and he knew in that heart there were thorns. There were weeds that were sitting under the surface that no one else saw. He was a leader in the church, a leader in the synagogue, rather. No one else saw, but Jesus knew that man loved his wealth, and if he would not give up his wealth, he would not follow Christ. So Christ said, give up all that you have, sell it all, give it to the poor, and then come follow me, because you cannot have thorns in your life. You cannot have those those weeds in your life, and pretend to follow me. I will not take a fake follower. And so that man, he, he counted the cost. He said, I, I love my wealth too much. And he walked away. I, I hope that's none of you. I hope that's none of us. Is there anything you love more than God? I hope not. I hope 
not. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one or you will love the other. So let me ask you some questions that, that you may have to face when you graduate and leave the greenhouse on campus. Would you, would you compromise your church involvement in order to succeed in your career and make more money? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to serve. I don't have to be that. I'm, I'm there on Sundays and I leave right after, but I'm there. I'll give. Sure, I'll give. Do you throw yourself into the church because that is your family, that is your spiritual family, and you know that you need to be there? Would you live a a sacrificial life and give generously to the church for the sake of the kingdom? Or when you start working, I mean, none of most of you guys are poor. You're not making money, I know that. You know, that offering basket goes by, I see, it's empty, it's all right. But one day you're gonna be making the big bucks, some of you. Remember me when you come into your kingdom? <laughs> Some of you will be making the big bucks, and what are you going to do? What are you going to do with that? You'll have more money than you will have ever imagined. What are you going to do with it? If you don't decide now that you're going to give faithfully, when you have the money, you're not going to want to give it. Make that choice now. Would you pursue a, a dating relationship with a non-believer because you're not finding any interest from... The, the believers at your church? Time and time again, I, I hear about people who say, well, he's just so nice. She's just so nice. Their discernment goes out the window. And they think, it'll be okay. I'm sharing the gospel with them. Their desire for that relationship supersedes their desire for that relationship with God. And that that thorn chokes out the word of God in their hearts. And man, I, I don't want that to be any of you. Would you play down your convictions to be liked by your peers? You know, I I remember as a student at GOC towards the end, I mean like Everybody I knew was part of GOC. I mean, I would try to make friends outside of GOC, but you guys are just so darn nice. I was like, ah, I'll go hang out with the GOCers. You can get by in college just kind of hanging out here. But that's not going to happen when you start working. And if you ask the people who work, it's a different world out there. It's a different world. Will you play down your convictions simply to be liked by your peers? Uh, there's so many other specific questions that could be asked. But you know your heart better than than I do. So let me just leave that with you. What are the competing desires in your heart? What are the sinful competitors in your heart that are trying to choke out the word? And once you recognize those, you must repent of them. Repent at the heart level, not just the actions where people see, but at the heart where God knows and you know. And I'll I want to make sure I make something clear because some people ask the question, are the, are the second and third soils saved? They, they seem to make some profession of faith. They seem to show some growth. The answer, just to be clear, no, they are not. The second and third soils are not saved. If you understand the biblical teaching of salvation, that your life has changed, that you bear fruit, the second and third soils are, are sad pictures of those who, maybe they didn't count the cost. They said, yeah, I'll start but they didn't follow through. True believers will bear fruit, and Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. Jesus said in John 15, the branch that does not bear fruit will be thrown away and cast into the fire. True believers will persevere to the end, bearing fruit. Does this mean that someone can lose their salvation? Absolutely not. It means that they were never truly saved to begin with. They didn't have the good soil, which became bad. It was bad, sto- bad soil from the start. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so that it would be shown that they were all not of us. So no, those who walk away, those whose faith is choked out, those whose faith does not withstand the temptation and trials, they are not saved. And this is an extremely, this is an extremely sobering, reality. Extremely sobering because 
all three of the last soils, the first one, no signs of life at all, but the last three, at some point, all look like they have fruit. They all look like they have life. They all look like they have growth and fruit, maybe, potentially. They all look like it. But two of them, two of them were not. And that's what's so sad that you looking out as one who has some responsibility spiritually over, over GOC, US, USC, I, I, I tremble because I, I don't know. I don't know. Who, are all of you the fourth good soil? I hope. I hope and I pray that's true. But the second and third soils, they, they, they look just the same. They look just the same. So ask yourself the hard questions. Do you have a superficial commitment? Do you have sinful competition? The last question, the last penetrating question to examine the soil of your heart. Is there supernatural conversion? Is there supernatural conversion? Look at verse 15 with me. But the seed, but the seed in the good soil. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. If you look at verse 7, or verse 8 rather, other seed fell into the good soil wasn't along, wasn't beside, wasn't on top, wasn't among. It was into. You look at verse 15, it says it's in the good soil. It's, it's been taken in. It's been internalized. It's been received deeply. Not only that, but look at how Jesus describes the heart. In an honest and good heart. This is literally, uh, the two words are, are different words, but they're, They could both be translated as good. This is a good and good heart. The first one kind of having a nuance of being noble, uh, a noble moral quality. The second one being of significant worth. And by using both of those together, there's this idea of integrity. It's not good and bad. It's good and good. It's honest and good. This This is a good heart. There's no deception there. There's no trickery there. There's no fickleness there. What do the... Those do with, with a good heart when they hear the word, it says they what? They hold it fast. They hold it fast. Reminds me of in John 6 when, when Jesus said some hard things and some of the people who were following Jesus said, these are hard statements. We can't follow you anymore. And they left and, and Jesus turned to his disciples and said, well, are you going to leave too? And Peter spoke up and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You you alone have the words of life. They they clung to those words. Do you cling to the word in your heart? 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells the Corinthians they would be saved if they held fast to the word, the gospel which he preached to them. Hebrews 10.23 says, hold fast, hold unswervingly to the hope you profess. Nothing should shake you from this. Don't let the pressures of the world, don't let the pleasures of this world, don't let the the difficulties of this world shake you from the word. And lastly, these these who are characteristic of the good soil, they, they bear fruit with perseverance. They don't just fizzle out along the way, but they bear fruit. And they do it with perseverance. This fruit is is the result of a spiritual life. The the fruit of the Spirit, you guys know the verse Galatians 5, 22, 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. You guys know that. There's an attitude change. It's not just external, but your heart has been changed from the inside out. You've got different attitudes. What used to make you angry makes you grieve for the sin that you see. What used to make you impatient, now you you have peace because you trust in God's perfect provision. 
This fruit's not just internal, like, oh, it's, the fruit's deep inside. Trust me, it's there. I just act mean. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly. It's, it's, it's deep. The word's deep in there. There's, no one could see it. No, th- th- this fruit exudes itself in your life, right? You, you've been, Ephesians 2.10 says, you've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. You should have a desire to serve, to serve others tangibly, physically. The idea of fruit means that these things flow naturally out of life. Jim might not remember this, but I remember when I was, a, I think, a freshman, he did a call to worship, and he talked about fruit. And he said, you would think I'm crazy, and I always thought he was crazy, but he said, you would think I'm crazy if, if I try to just staple fruit onto my tree. Look, my tree is healthy and has fruit. <laughs> Little did I know that Jim would be a, a good friend and a wise Bible teacher. You can't just staple on fruit. It doesn't make any sense that the fruit grows out of a life that is clinging to God's word, that has received the word, that has believed, that has loved Christ, and has believed the gospel, and your, 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 your faith pr- produces fruit. And it takes time. Fruit doesn't, I planted that tree yesterday. I came out today. There's no fruit. I'm going to be like Jesus. May no one ever eat from you again. It takes time. It takes time. So, that wasn't in my notes. I just kind of made that up. But. Fruit takes time. Fruit takes time. Don't be wowed by that quick joy. Wow. I mean, I mean hey, I, I'm, I'm glad. Anytime someone makes a profession of faith, I'm glad. I'm excited. But just experience says, you know what, wait. Wait a little bit. The, the good soil will bear fruit in time with perseverance. They will last till the end. So as you look at your life, do you see fruit? Because that fruit is, is the evidence of supernatural conversion. That God has done something in your life, radically changed you, radically converted you. The, the, the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 1, you were born dead in your trespasses and sins. You were born dead. Has God given you life? Has God taken that heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh? By his word, has he come in and plowed through the hardened path of your heart? Jeremiah 23, 29 says, The word of God is like a fire and like a hammer which shatters the rock. Has the word of God done that in your life? Have you been supernaturally converted? Has God come in and replaced that heart of stone or the heart of flesh? Has he gone in and removed the thorns that say, love the world, love the pleasures of the flesh? Has it removed those weeds and said, now love Christ? The things that you used to love, now you hate. The things that you used to hate, you now love. Has that happened to you? Has he plowed through the fields of your heart with conviction by the Spirit? Has he softened and saturated the soil of your heart with his merciful rain? Examine your heart. Is it the good soil? If your answer is no, you don't know what I'm talking about. What are you talking about, this new birth? I'm just trying to grip my teeth and do what I'm supposed to do. There's no joy. There's no change of desires. Then, then you have never experienced this, and I want you to listen closely. The, the God who made everything, the, the God who made you and me, the God who made you to know him and to love him, you have rejected your whole life. From the moment you were born, you have rejected him and done things your own way and snubbed your your thumb at him and said, I will do it my way. I don't want you. I don't need you. That's what the Bible says, that we were born in sin. He knows everything about you, everything wrong that you have ever done. And you deserve judgment like I deserved judgment. But in his great love that is completely unfathomable, completely unthinkable, Though you deserved his eternal punishment, he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, whom he loves, to die for you. To 
to take upon himself the punishment of all who would ever believe. He lived a perfect life. He didn't deserve any punishment. But God saw it fit to send his son to take the punishment of all who would ever believe. My sins have earned me an eternity in hell, and so have yours. And God, in his mercy, says, I will take your punishment and put it on Christ. And if you put your faith in Christ, you will never pay for a single sin you have ever committed. You can go free because of God's mercy and because of Christ's sacrifice. He paid it all for those who would believe. That is the good news. That is the seed of the word that is going out. And it is going out now, and you have heard it. How will you respond? This Jesus died on a cross, paying for the sins of the world, and because he's God in the flesh, the grave couldn't hold him. And three days later, he rose from the grave to show his victory over death, and he reigns in heaven, and he commands all men everywhere to repent and believe in him and love him and worship him. And this is what you're made for. And until you until you go in that direction, you're going to be aimlessly wandering through this life, pulling after weeds and thorns and thinking this is going to satisfy you, and it won't. So I hope and I pray that these words, this seed, this gospel, this good news of God's salvation that is made available to you, apart from anything you do, but by faith alone, I pray that this would not fall on hard hearts, would not fall on shallow hearts, would not fall on on infested hearts, but that it would fall on hearts with good soil, ready to take in the word, to hold fast and to to bear fruit 30, 60, 100-fold. And if you you have repented of your sins and you have believed and you have examined your heart and you, you know that God has done a supernatural work in your life, then, then I would say to you, excel still more. If you're the 30-fold fruit, be the 60. If you're the 60-fold fruit, be the 100. Pursue Christ all the more. Grow even more. So that when you leave this greenhouse on campus, you'd be able to look back and thank God for those pivotal years where he, he pruned you, he grew you, he gardened you, he watered you, and he, he caused you to grow. My prayer for you is that you would continue to bear fruit with perseverance while you're here and, and, and many years after. So brothers and sisters, take, take care how you listen. Take care how you listen because there are many who sit here and don't have ears to hear. And after a few years here, going through the motions will fall away. I pray that that would not be any one of you. Examine your heart. Has there been satanic confiscation? Has there been supernatural or uh, superficial commitments? Is there, is there sinful competition for your heart? Or has there been supernatural conversion? And if you have experienced that supernatural conversion, then praise God. Praise God, and I challenge you, excel still more for the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word that is so clear. Thank you for your word that is so powerful, that is, that is a fire and a hammer that is able to shatter rock. And I thank you, Lord, that you have saved so many here. And I ask, Lord, that you would, even, even for those of us who are saved, there are still shallow areas. There are still thorns and weeds in areas of our lives. And I pray that you would root those out still yet. And I pray, Lord, for those who are here who have never heard the gospel. Maybe they have heard it before, but it's bounced off. The birds have picked it away. I pray that even tonight that your word would have its effect. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation you give. We, we cannot say enough to thank you. And I pray that now, even as we sing, that this would just be a partial return in terms of praise to you, in terms of thanksgiving because of what Christ has done on our behalf. We thank you. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen.